Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Thank you all. Praise the Lord, yeah. Great to see all of you here today. Praise the Lord. And all of you that are with us on Facebook and uh, live streaming, God bless you. Appreciate you being with us as well. Um, big part of the service, always, your prayers and your cooperation and participation in the Spirit is, uh, makes the services all that much better. Praise the Lord. And we appreciate that. And, of course, all of you that are here, God bless you for coming out and being with us this morning. Thank you, Mike and Suzanne, as always. And uh, Tim, great job. Appreciate it. Glad for the good report and expecting even better uh, testimonies to come. Praise God. <coughs> Suzanne and, and Jody, thank you for leading us in worship. Praise the Lord. Great. And the rest of you, well, just good to be here. Praise the Lord. It's not like you're not doing anything, you know. It's just <laughs> praise God. Uh, we love you and appreciate you being here today. Praise God. And, uh, of course, we've got big stuff coming. We've got an election coming up on Tuesday. And, Man, I, I, I'll be glad to have it over just because I'm so sick of the... I just want to scream and choke somebody, praise the Lord. Fortunately, I'm usually upstairs watching and Sally's downstairs. Otherwise, it would be a ring around the collar or something. But anyhow, you know, here's the thing. 98% of the adults in this country are decent, hard-working Americans. It's the other lousy 2% that get all the publicity. But then we elected them, so... Political speeches are like a steer. There's a point here, a point there, and a lot of bull in between. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. How many presidents does it take to screw in a light bulb? How many presidents does it take to change a light bulb? None. They only promise change. <laughs> I wish I need the drummer up here. Praise God. Okay, so I'll wrap up here. Uh, I've been accused of being a pessimist. So I went and bought a copy, or I was going to buy this copy of The Power of Positive Thinking. And I thought, what's the point? Uh, thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Okay. I appreciate all the testimonies this morning. As always, they resonate with what I feel like the Holy Spirit is saying to me, and it just kind of amplifies that and, uh, and helps me at least to feel like uh, I haven't missed it completely. Praise the Lord. So if, let's, go, let's begin this morning with uh, Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 24. Thank you, Jesus. Isaiah 14 and 24. We're living in a time... You know, I, I think for years, in this country especially, there were issues. There's certain times when you would have to have faith. You'd have to exercise faith. But I've got to be honest with you. Because we live in this country and we have a lot of advantages, and I'm not saying there aren't disadvantaged people and, and issues of that nature, but for the most part, we haven't had to really live by faith. Just work hard. You know, do your stuff. Stay out of trouble as much as possible, and you could just get by. Thank you. Praise the Lord. The emojis are coming at me hard and fast. Praise God. But uh, it's true. You know, I mean, we could kind of skate a little bit and get away with it. But we're coming into a time, and I believe are in that point right, at that point right now, where it's going to take faith. And uh, we need to get focused on that reality and begin to operate from there. I'm not saying this to be frightening or to scare you. I'm just saying this is how God created us to operate. And we're going to be in a position where we have to operate that way. So thank God that he has given us those opportunities and that ability to live by faith. Praise the Lord. And that's really what I want to talk to you about this morning. Because with each, with each day that passes, I see more negative stuff. More, you know, would be frightening if I didn't know the Lord. Yeah. I'm always saying, you know, if you're scared of dying, you ain't living. But, I mean, but you still want to use common sense, right? It's like barbecue. If you're looking, you ain't cooking, praise the Lord. And so that's kind of the way I try to approach it. I'm not going to let this keep me from living my life. You know what I'm saying? And 
I'll, I'll respect other people's angst and, and concerns, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying I'm not going to let it stop me from enjoying my family, being with my friends, going to church, doing the things that I feel are important. And everybody has to make that decision for themselves. And I'm not trying to, you know, like, you're wrong if you're not doing what I'm doing. I'm just saying we're coming to a place in life and in time where faith is going to be the, the answer to all the issues that we're faced with. Because we don't know. Tuesday, maybe your man will get elected. And maybe he won't. But whichever way it turns out, there's going to be about half of this country who's going to be upset. So what are we going to do then? Well, I have my choice, you all have your choice, and that's the way it should be. We're Americans, we have a right to vote, and we have a responsibility to vote. But regardless of who gets in there, you better be trusting God because yeah. they're just human beings. Yes. And they can screw up, and we know they can because most of us have lived long enough to see them do it. On every level, you know. Yeah. So faith is what we're after, yes. and faith is what God is trying to get us to understand and to operate in to the highest level. People are looking. And they're looking to Christians, have you got something that we don't already have? Or are you just trying to feed us a little, you know, spice or something with this thing? No, this is a whole other ballgame that we're dealing with. So the Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, surely as I have thought, so shall it come to pass. And as I have purposed, so shall it stand. All right, let's go to Job uh, 23, verses 12 through 14. Job 23, verses 12 through 14. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. But he is in one mind, and who can turn him? And what his soul desireth, even that he doeth. For he performeth the thing that is appointed for me, and many such things are with him. 2 Corinthians 10, 5 through 7. We're getting the picture here that when God says something, he does it. And whatever God is, he will always be. He doesn't change. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ having a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Do you look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trusts to himself that he is Christ, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ, even so are we Christ. Praise the Lord. So it's, uh, it's God's nature to be purposeful. I mean, he doesn't do things randomly. He doesn't do, just get up one day and go, well, let's give this a shot. He's purposeful in everything that he does. Amen? Every time he's revealed in human history, any time we see a revelation of God in the history of man, it's because he wanted something specifically accomplished, and he would work it out through people. I mean, to go back as far as you want to go, that's just how God operates. Amen? God is a God of action based on purpose. And his purposes are as eternal as he is. They don't change. Whatever God has purposed, still his purpose. Amen? Psalms 33 and 11. In other words, when some chaotic mess happens on the earth, it doesn't change God's purpose at all. It doesn't change anything about it. He's not like humans. He doesn't have to back up, take another route, you know, travel on. The last, uh, I don't know, three weeks or so, uh, East Douglas has been closed up here, which is the way I usually come into town. And in fact, I have come in that way several times and had to turn around and go back out because I forgot what I had driven on the day before. But then, nevertheless, uh, I have to, re I have to find another route, so I have to detour. Not God. Road closed doesn't mean a thing to God. You know, bridge out doesn't matter. He's gonna, he's, his purpose is still going to be accomplished, right? right? So the counsel of the Lord standeth forever. The thoughts of his heart to all generations. Praise the Lord. The counsel of the Lord stands. So what God says, in other words, forever. It's forever. The thoughts of his heart for every generation. Well, his purpose, in other words, is the same for every generation. It's just up to that generation whether or not they're going to fulfill the purpose. Praise the Lord. So nothing could stop God's purposes. 
they always come to pass. Now I'm emphasizing that. Nothing can stop God's purpose. It will always come to pass. It has to come to pass. Or else He's not God. Alright? So everything God created, and everyone that God created, serve as a unique purpose. And that includes every one of us that are here today, and everybody else out there in the world. Don talked about it. Tim was talking about it as well. It's, the idea is... We're created for a time such as this. It wasn't just Esther. It's every human being. It's just Esther found her place. She found out what her thing was and actually stepped up and did it. Sadly, most of us don't. We just kind of meander through life and hope that we survive as much as possible and then get on with heaven. But Ephesians 1, 4, and 5, every one of us have a purpose for being here. Say, well, I, I don't know what that could be. You know, I'm just, I'm just, I do this, I've got that, I've got the other thing. I mean, I understand my family, I have responsibilities. No, there's something divinely appointed about every one of us. And finding that is the key to having a satisfied life, to having a fulfilled life, to having a life that has impact and has meaning. Amen? And I'm not talking about preaching necessarily in a pulpit or, or any of those things, but there is a, God has a purpose for you. And if you ever find it, sometimes we go through life and we, we're, we're doing the purpose, we just don't know it. Right. But God wants us to be aware. He wants us to be as purposeful as He is about why we're here and what we're doing in this life. And I'm not talking about religion now. I'm not talking about being weird. I'm talking about just loving people, being there, doing the things that you can do to make a difference. In, according as He hath chosen us in Him, chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will. Praise the Lord. Yes. None of us are accidents. None of us are mistakes. That's why I think, and I don't want to really get off into this too much, but that's why, that's why abortion is so horrible. And if you've had one, hey, God forgives you, you know, and you'll see that baby in heaven. We all make mistakes. But I'm saying the thing is that God has a purpose for every person. And that purpose begins at creation. When that child is formed, as Tim said, before you were formed in your mother's womb, God already knew this child was going to be born. And he has a purpose for that child. So we're not only depriving that child of life, we're depriving God of a purpose for that child to be there in the first place. We're being God. We're playing God. That would get you in a lot of trouble. Praise the Lord. And I, I wanna, I, I'm going to read this from the New International in, in Ecclesiastes. So you, if you don't have it up there, don't worry about it, Suzanne. I can just read it from the Bible. But in, in the New International Version, just because it's a little clearer, in Ecclesiastes 3 and 1, it says there's a time for every purpose. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. And then verse 11 says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity into the hearts of men, yet they cannot fathom. He's put something of eternity in every life, in every human being. We just have a problem figuring that out. We just have a problem understanding or comprehending that doesn't make it any less true. It just means we have trouble understanding, right? So in verse 2, it says, A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. So you didn't just show up on earth. You were born at the right time to fulfill a purpose of God. In Ecclesiastes 3.10, he says, I have seen the burden God has laid on men. I have seen the burden that God has laid on men. The, the word burden is a Hebrew word that's asa, and it's, uh, it means to have a heavy responsibility or occupation or a task. And it can also be described as a responsible urge, a sense that there's something I need to be doing, there's something... I should do, I could do, I want to do, whatever. And then in verse 11 again, 
He says, he has made everything beautiful in his time. He has also set eternity into the hearts of men. Yet they cannot fathom what God has done from the beginning to the end. Praise the Lord. He has also set eternity into the hearts of humans. That's powerful. I mean, there is something in us that's being called by eternity. Something outside of this realm. A call that comes from somewhere besides the world. Somewhere besides politics. Somewhere besides hatred and variance and anger and frustration and all of that. There's a call that calls us, that urges us to do something that we don't feel we have the capacity to do or the understanding to do it. We, we live in time and space. And we've talked about quantum physics and that stuff in the past. And I mean, I can repeat stuff I don't really understand very well, right? Well, life is kind of that way. There are things that we may know, we just don't understand it, right? We just operate from that reality. Well, we live in a time where there is time and there's space. But time and space are also connected to eternity because they wouldn't exist without it. Yeah. Amen? There's something that God has put into our hearts that calls the unseen seen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Praise the Lord. We're, we're supposed to speak things yeah. that are not as though they are. Right. Just like God. Right. He said, deep calleth unto deep. Yes. The eternal is calling the eternal. The eternity of God is calling the eternity that's in us. That's what we're experiencing. That's what we're feeling. That's what, if, there's, if we could say it, that's what separates us from the unsaved. That's the real truth. That's, that's not that we're better. We're all flawed. We all come short of the glory of God. We, I could give you a list, I won't, of all my wife's flaws. No, I'm just kidding. Of my, <laughs> praise the Lord, of my issues. It's the only reason I'm married. I've got to have somebody to take the, you know, off of me. Praise the Lord. So, <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. Am I gonna, I'm going to pay for this. I do every time, but I can't help myself. Praise the Lord. Let's uh, look at Psalms 42, 7. And that's where that scripture comes from. And it's deep calling to deep. It's, it's God calling to God. It's the eternal reality calling the eternity that's in us. That is our yeah. real reality. Amen. Uh, 42 7, I'm sorry. Psalms 42 7. Praise the Lord. Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. That reminds me of a, a few experiences I've had with God where you know you're making contact. You know that, you know what I mean? What I'm saying? By faith we pray and we do things and we don't necessarily always have a word back from God, but there have been times when you're in. Uh, a time of prayer or meditation or whatever it is or reading the Bible and all of a sudden God is so real and it's that deep calling to deep it's the eternal and you coming together you know and it's like you're just flooded with the presence of God it's overwhelming I mean it'll just cause you to fall on your face and weep and you know you, it's, it's wild but that's what he's talking about here and that's what God is doing with us all the time the deep which is God is always calling to the God that's in us or the deep that is in us, the spiritual part of us, to come into conformity with His purpose. Amen. And so a lot of, we, we, we've turned it into, religiously, we've turned it into, you know, dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's and doing all the right stuff. That's not what it is. It's about coming into fellowship with God. It's about coming into an understanding of, okay, i got a reason for being here, and it's not just for this job that I've got or this thing that I do. But there's something far deeper than this that I need to discover, that I want to experience in order for my life to be fulfilled. Right? And so he says that uh, he lives in eternity. So God's done this really awesome thing. He lives in eternity, and yet he has specifically placed you and me in time. Now, to me, I wonder about that. I think, you know, wouldn't it have been easier just to let us stay spirits from the beginning? And, but he has put us in time so that others on earth 
can see a piece of eternity that's him. Because unless they have God and experience with God, they don't understand any of it. They, they just feel lost. And, you know, and which is why drugs and alcohol and, uh, you know, crazy sex and, and violence and anger. It's, it's, I don't know who I am. I don't know what I'm supposed to be. I just, I got to do something. I mean, I got to have some kind of enjoyment or what I think is enjoyment, right? Because you don't know where, what your real purpose is, what you're really all about. So you just kind of meander. I mean, I've done it. That's the way I lived my life for years. I'm a child of the 60s. I mean, I wasn't a little kid in the 60s. I was a, you know, I was a teenager. So, uh, and a young adult, you know, right up to the end of the, the decade of the 60s, I was 21 in 69, you know? So, so I lived that whole thing, uh, John and I. He's, he's had his head down like, nah. He's only six months older than me, so I know he was in the crap before I was. Just that far ahead. But I'm just saying, God has put something in all of us. And everybody's trying to find it, whether they know it or not. They're just looking for love in all the wrong places. You know, they're just looking for the answer in the wrong place, in the wrong situation, right? So look at this in Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10. The world, the unsaved, those that have not experienced the eternity in themselves need to see it somewhere. Yes. And that's why we're here. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Praise the Lord. So we're living, you know, and uh, we think about all the things just in my lifetime, uh, Korea, Vietnam, which I was involved in, uh, all of the, the violence and stuff back in the 60s with the racial issues and, and so on and so forth. Just one thing after another, uh, wars, rumors of wars, all the things that we know of. And yet, God, none of this shocks God. None of this surprises God. None of this freaks God out the way it does us. He knows the end from the beginning. Yes. He started the beginning at the end. Yes. If that makes any sense. Two things God establishes. The end before the beginning. And then he finishes things in the spirit realm and comes back to the natural and starts them up in the physical realm. If you think about creation, this is what it was. He, was, he, he goes to the end of what he's going to do. He's saying at what he's going to do, and then he goes back to the natural or to the physical and actually does it. But first he says it. First he has it in his mind. First it's a faith thing, right? So he, he reveals the end results of something when it hasn't even started yet, when it hasn't even begun. I mean, just think about us. We were in Christ before the foundation of the world. How can that be? Because as far as humans were concerned, Christ didn't even exist yet. Not as a man. Not even as the resurrected man. So we were in him. We were in God before there was a Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Now, if, I know you, you can argue about that if you want, but, but I won't argue with you. So. But what I'm saying is, Jesus, the man came out of the Word of God, came from what yes. God spoke. Yes. Yes. And what God had spoken was that we were already in Him. Yes. Yes. So it can get, seem convoluted, but the truth is, the end always comes before the beginning, as far as God's concerned. He doesn't just, do, he doesn't just go roll the dice and let's shoot craps here and see what happens. No, He already knows what's going to happen, or He wouldn't roll the dice in the first place. Right. He knows the outcome. I'm, I'm, that's a poor metaphor, but I'm just saying God knows what the end result is before he does one single thing. Amen. Praise the Lord. He's alpha and omega, yes. beginning yes. and ending. Yes. Think about salvation. We read some scripture already this morning, but he says, on the one hand, you were already saved before you were born. 
And yet when you were born, you weren't saved. And you might have lived 30 years, 40 years, 10 years, 20 years, doesn't matter, whatever it was, before you were actually saved. But not in the mind of God. You were saved before you even existed. Before you, physically you existed. Right? So, praise the Lord. We just have trouble understanding that fact. That when God starts something, He has already completed it in eternity. Yes. Praise the Lord. Before anything happens, He's already done it in the spirit realm. Then He just comes back to the physical realm and creates it. And again, let me read this to you in Ecclesiastes 3.11. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Yes. He has also set eternity into the hearts of men, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. So what religion does is try to explain this stuff. And it's not explainable intellectually. It's, you, you're not going to grasp it that way. It has to be by the Spirit. So we all sense this. It's just trying to put into words that your mind would understand. That's why we have to have faith. In creation, everything was already finished in God's mind before He had laid the foundation of the world. The end. He knew the end. He's seen Satan already in the pit. He's already seen the destruction of the fallen angels. He's already seen the new heaven and the new earth. He's already seen the saints rising up to a level of Jesus Christ and operating in this world just like Jesus. So actually, God completed us before He created us. Yes. Woo! Yes. That'll make the hair stand up on your neck. Praise the Lord. God wants you to see yourself perfect in Him. He's never, he's never created anything that wasn't perfect. Praise the Lord. And the reason is because He already knows what that thing is going to be. There, you can't deviate from it. You may think you can. You can be a jerk for a few years. But God's still going to get you on the path yes. that He created you for. And you're going to end up there where He created you to be. Yes. Even though as humans we try to deviate and, and go our own way and think our own thoughts and do our own stuff. Look, the bottom line is we were predestined yes. to be saved. We were predestined to be in Christ. We were predestined to be one with God. Yes. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. Now, if He and His Father were one, we are brothers. Yes. You know, yes. So we're one. Yes. Male, female, there is not, none of that stuff as far as eternity is concerned. Yes. Just Christ-like. Right. Praise the Lord. So, God always finishes what He starts. And he accomplishes his purposes. Yes. So, how about take a chill pill here? Instead of trying to complete yourself, yeah. you can just rest yes. in yes. him to do yes. the job. That's what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 11, 28, and 30. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you because it's easy. Yeah. Right? Take my yoke. Learn of me. I'm meek and lowly in heart. You'll find rest for your souls. Yeah. For all this. Right? For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Remember the burden that we talked about in the very beginning? What was the burden? The burden is that we have a calling. We have a purpose. To accomplish. Jesus is talking about the very same thing. He said, the purpose I have for you is easy if you'll just trust me to do it. If you'll just let me accomplish it, rather than you trying to do this, come to me, relax, rest in what the finished work of God, what God has declared you to be, the righteousness of God in Christ. Rest in that and you'll see you'll accomplish so much more than all the ranting and raving and all of the religious mumbo jumbo and, right? Just come and rest. Come to the eternal one to experience your eternity. Yes. To have what God has created you to be. To be what God has declared you to be. Right? We were born to manifest something that's already finished. Not to make the thing and then try to manifest it. We're just supposed to manifest what's already done. 
Amen? And your end doesn't look anything like your beginning. Because God perfected you in the end, and then came back and started the process in the beginning. Yes. Knowing that you were already perfect in Him. Yes. Is this making sense to anybody? Because it's, yes. it's tripping my trigger. I mean, I'm excited yes. about the fact that I can, you know, just chill a little bit here. I don't have to try to figure out how I'm going to be the nicest guy in the world, and how I can be perfect, and do all that stuff. Because I've got a wife that will rat me out every time. No, I mean, I can't hide it. I can't hide it. If I'm a jerk, I'm a jerk, right? But God says, you're not a jerk. You're the righteousness of God in Christ. I need to quit worrying about trying to fix me and start le learning how to rest in Him. And He'll do the fixing. He'll take care of those issues that are so, you know, disturbing to us. Why? I, you know, I got to wonder how, when I'm in the middle of all my crazy, you know, 30, 40 years ago, God's loving me. And I'm thinking, now this is, that's not right. How's he loving me? When no one, seeing this, I mean, that's, that can't be. It can't be. Even God couldn't do that. No, God wasn't looking at that. He was looking at the end. He's looking at the end. He's looking at me in Christ. He's seeing Jesus. Amen. That's true for all of us. That's the message this world needs. That's the, that's the thing they need to understand. Yes, you can stumble around and do stupid and be dumb and do ignorant things, but yet God sees you as the righteousness of Him in Christ. It's like the, the little baby, you just love them. They stink, they crap themselves, they've done what, who knows what, and they, you, oh, yeah, <laughs> right? But they're, they're, I love them. It's a kid, you know, it's my kid. It's going to grow up, it's going to be... Hopefully not like me. Praise the Lord. But you know what I mean? That's just, you, we, we don't look at the things that would normally turn. Now, if it's somebody else's kid, I'm just you. Whoa. Right? Isn't it weird? I mean, I could change my own kid's pants, but man, don't bring your kid over. I mean, I'm not doing that. I can't handle that. Whew. Sorry, I'm, I don't know where I'm going here. Praise the Lord. But anyhow, <laughs> thank you, Jesus. We were born to manifest something that's already finished. Yes. And your end doesn't look like your beginning. No. But your beginning to God looked just like your end. Yes. Perfect. He saw the end from the beginning. He defined you as holy, righteous, perfect. Yes. In the midst of all your chaos, in the midst yes. of all of your fear, in the midst of all of your failure. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. So let me just. That's why the just have to live by faith. Faith is seeing the future in the present. And when you have faith, you can see things you hope to have or you hope to achieve. That's what it's for. Look at Romans 8, 28 through 31. Romans 8, 28 through 31. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God to them who are called according to his purpose. They have to, if, if what I've just said is true, what the Bible is telling us, everything that happens to us has to be for our good, because God's already declared us to be good, to be righteous, and to be holy. So everything that's happening, even though it's negative, it's not going to affect our outcome. It's not going to affect our identity. It's not going to affect who we are and what we're capable of as far as God's concerned. So whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That's what Don was talking about. But see, it is exactly that. God looked 6,000 years, 8, 000, I don't know how many thousands of years, but it doesn't really matter. He just saw the end, and he saw me looking just like Jesus. Yeah. Every one of us, he knew that would come to him. He sees him just that way. And so then he brings us back to the place of origin, or back to our start, whenever that might have been, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, whatever, whenever you were born. And then he starts the process of getting you back to your reality, to who you really are in him. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Because whoever he predestinated... Those were the ones that he called. Mm -hmm. And whom he called, them he also justified. Mm -hmm. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. 
So then I look around and I see COVID-19 and I see rioting and I see hatred and I see variants and I see judgment and all these kind of crazy things that are going on in the world. What do I say to those things? If God's for me. Who can be against me? Not a disease, not hatred, not misunderstanding, not, not bitterness, not strife, not, not ethnicity, not any of that stuff. Here's the thing. It's not just me. It's everybody else as believers. So we're looking at things and we're going, oh, boy, this doesn't look good. And I've got to tell you, I, the last few weeks I've thought about my kids, my grandkids, great grandkids, not understanding most of this stuff, but just kind of in it. But I don't have to fear because me and my house are going to be saved. Yes. And because of that, they are already the righteousness of God in Christ. They're already protected. They're already provided for. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. So, life is the way you see it. Praise the Lord. Look at Ephesians 1, verses 3 and 4. I think we did read those earlier, but let's go back there again. Blessed by the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. That's in the spirit realm. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Praise the Lord. God has already blessed us with everything we need. It's in heavenly places or the heavenly realm, or the spirit realm. Amen? What we bind on earth is bound in heaven. What we loose on earth is loosed in heaven. That's the authority that he's given us. That's what we're capable of doing. Amen? Because we are no different than Jesus. And this may take a leap of faith, but Jesus is no different than God. So when we were in Christ before the foundation of the world, what God is saying was, I had already thought about you. I had already know you. Mm-hmm. I know you intimately. I know you better than anybody will ever know you. Better than you will even know yourself. Yes. Amen? Yes. Because we were in him. That's what Jesus said, isn't it? He says, you know, I want, what I want to happen is that God will be glorified so that you're in me and I'm in him. And ultimately what happens, everything comes back to where it started. And that's in God. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. That's, the, that's yes. the final thing. I mean, that's the end of all of it. Yes. Praise the Lord. So that's why we have to live by faith. Looking forward with expectation for everything that God has said is ours because it's completed. Otherwise, you'll only believe what you see with your physical eyes. Praise the Lord, which makes you no better than the unsaved. I mean, in terms of your, your outcome. Again, in the NIV, in chapter 3 of Ecclesiastes, verse 14, it says, Let me find it again. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it. Nothing taken from it. God does it so that men will revere him or believe in him. Amen. Look at uh, Psalms 37, 4, uh, Suzanne. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Now, here's one everybody's probably debated about at some point or another when you wanted something you didn't get or thought you should have or wanted or however that all worked out. But he says the desires of your what? The spirit. Right? No, he said, wait, well, wait a minute now. Doesn't God give us the desires from heaven? If we're calling things loosing on earth, what's loosed in heaven, right? Binding on earth, what's bound in heaven? Yeah, he does. Because our desires originated there. 
But remember, God has placed his desire for you within your heart. Otherwise, nobody would come to Jesus. He's placed eternity in each and every one of us. Praise God. And he wants to give us the desires of the Spirit. Right? It's to, which is what? To be one with God. To, to, to be free from fear and, yes. and doubt and unbelief. Right? Praise the Lord. Romans 11, verse 29. That's what's so crazy about it because it's funny. When you come to, when you come to the Lord, now it doesn't mean you won't ever have bad desires or, or negative kind of things you'd like to do or want to do if you get upset or whatever. But they don't, they don't have the same motivation because you know that they are only what they are, and that's temporal, where before you thought they were the answer. Yeah. You know, I'm, maybe I'm speaking for myself, but I'm saying, you know, when you get into different things, and it was, yeah. we, you know, we're talking about finding ourselves back in the 60s. Yeah. Thank God I didn't because I, I would have never lived past the 60s. But, you know, I mean, that's what we were saying. Oh, you're going to... You've got to find myself. I've got to find the real me and all that. What is that? That's, that's the heart. It's the spirit crying out. And we're looking for the answers in the wrong places. We're trying to get high. We're trying to deal with this thing up here instead of this thing here. And that's, people still do it today. I mean, it didn't just happen in the 60s. It just happened to be that was the generation that kind of got exposed because of it. And I can guarantee you 90% of the people that I know, for sure the ones that I knew that, that went through the 60s, uh, when they got to be about 35, decided that was about the dumbest thing I could have ever done. But it seemed right at the time, you know? And the few that, uh, that never discovered that are now in politics, and that's why we got part of the curve. <laughs> Sorry, but it's the truth. Uh, amen. They're more closer to my age than they are to your age for the most part, and the ones who are closer to your age are only following the lead of the idiots that were doing what I was doing back in the 60s and never got past it. A little insight from Brother Nathan. Praise the Lord. <laughs> for the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. In other words, whatever God intended for you, He's not going to change that. I don't care what you do. It's not going to change His purpose. It's not going to change what His plan is for you. And I can testify to this because I know what God had a plan for me. I was in Christ before the foundation of the world. And I did everything humanly possible to destroy that purpose. Not intentionally, I didn't know, but I'm just saying, in my life, I did everything contrary to that, and God still brings it to pass, to where I come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not a perfect person or anything else, but I can tell you this, I'm born again. Yes. I am a new creation in Christ. Yes. Praise the Lord. That was God's intention, regardless of what my intent was. Yes. And He'll make my desire, or His desire, my desire, and He did that on the living room floor of my house in Houston, Texas, when I said, God, I can't live like this anymore. I can't change me. I'm tried and it doesn't work. Either kill me or fix me. Yep. Right? Deliver me. Yep. What was that cry? Was it frustration? No, it was the cry of eternity trying to get me to the place that God intended me to be in the first place. Yes. But I had to give Him the okay. I had to come to a place where deep cries out to deep. Right? And that's what happened to all of us in our own little way. I mean, it may not have been my story, it may not be your story, but the truth is, the stories are all parallels. They're, they're all the same. Just the approach was a little different, maybe. Amen? See, the world needs to know this. They need to know this isn't about 12 steps to Jesus. This is about one step in the direction of God, and He'll meet you. He'll be like the prodigal, uh, the father. You know, you take one step towards him and he's running to you because he knows this is the plan I had all along and you're not going to mess it up. Here's, here's the cloak that you wore in me before you were, uh, you know, human. This, this is your robe of righteousness. Here's your sandals. Here's your ring of authority. Never changed. You've always had that. It was always here. You just had to wake up to it. You just had to come to a place where you would receive it. Praise the Lord. So... Romans 11, uh, 29, for the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. Look at it now, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. And this you know, sometimes is one of the hardest things to discover. It took me a long time, and I'm still, I still struggle with it from time to time. But he says, for we are his workmanship. I think Tim read this scripture in another translation. But for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, 
which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now what religion does is try to get us to, to walk like Jesus in our own power. You know, straighten up, quit doing that, get your act together, put those away, don't have any of that, and start being righteous. Well, you can't. Not human. It's not humanly possible. We are His workmanship. And we were created in Christ Jesus under good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now, what's he saying? We're not saved by doing good works. We're saved for the purpose of doing God's work. Yeah. Didn't Jesus say, there's none good but one? You call me good master? He said, there's only one that's good, and that's God. So he's given, he's, he saved us so that I can doing not my, not my effort, not my good works, not my nice, nice guy. No, his works. God's works. What, what is God's work? Reconciliation. Right? We, Jesus reconciled us to God, and then God gives us the ministry of reconciliation. For what? Well, we don't need to be reconciled. We already have been. It's so that we can reveal the light of God to somebody else. Mm -hmm. The grace of God, the mercy of God, the love of God, the fact that they, could, they were in Christ before the foundation of the world, if they can only receive it, if they can just yeah. believe it. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. 2 Corinthians 10, and verse 5. And here, again, we can get screwed up with this because basically religion tells you uh, everything's sin. I mean, nearly everything is sin. But casting down imaginations, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, this is, just look at that again. Casting down imaginations, or our, our thoughts, our, our kind of figures, I figured this out. You know, I got it. Just forget that, because you'll probably have it screwed up. Casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So any idea or any act that is not contrary to the Word of God is a God idea. Right? That's why you can have, you know, businesses, uh, jobs, uh, relationships and all that, you don't have to necessarily find a scripture that says do this. You just got to make sure there isn't a scripture in there that says don't do that. Right? Because he'll make our own ideas his idea. Because they were his idea before they were our idea. Am I making any sense? He's already put eternity in us. So we think, I have this brilliant idea, or I decided to do this and life changed. And No, you just caught up with the idea that God had from the very beginning. And now, just because it doesn't spell it out step by step in the Bible doesn't mean it wasn't God, as long as it doesn't contradict something that God has said. That's what he's talking about, casting down imagination or any idea that would exalt itself above what God has said. Yes. But as long as it doesn't contradict what God said, it's a God thought. Yes. Praise the Lord. He, okay, look, uh, Hebrews 11, 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, right? Yes. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things... <laughs> Not seen. So where does this faith come from? The scripture says it isn't even our faith. It's the faith of Jesus Christ that we're putting our confidence in. So faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things that you can't see. Faith is seeing the future and the present. Just think about that. If, if I'd had the capacity or the understanding in 1966 or 67, when I was really crazy, 65 maybe, a little bit, I would have understood, even in the midst of my craziness, I had a higher calling, a greater purpose, a greater reality than what I was receiving. Because the truth is, I was looking for what was invisible. That's why I was doing the drugs. I was looking for answers that, that weren't there, right? But if I had only understood that that was God calling me or drawing me, even though I couldn't see it, 
faith in what God had said about me would have changed things 25 years sooner. Praise the Lord. Now, it doesn't change the fact that it's going to happen. It's just a question of when is it going to happen and how is it going to happen and how much crap am I going to create between now and then. Praise the Lord. If you're operating by sight, what do you see? COVID-19. You see chaos. You see fear. You see anxiety. You see stresses. You see a, a, a nation that is so divided and, and so full of hate and, and bitterness. You see the problems. You see challenges everywhere. Sight without faith is dangerous because there's no hope in it. That's why people commit suicide. That's why people kill other people. No hope. Won't change. I got to just put a stop to it. But look at Genesis 1.26. We're wrapping up here. Praise the Lord. Genesis 1.26. God said he created man in his own image. After his likeness, right? So he said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish, the sea, so on and so forth. So he created man in his own image after his likeness. Image refers to the moral and spiritual, spiritual character of God, right? And what does he say? We are the righteousness of God in Christ. We were created this way, folks. It didn't happen just 20 years ago. You see what I'm saying? The end from the beginning. He created us in his image. His image is that we would be holy and righteous without fault, without blame, without any negatives. That's how we were created. Amen? And the likeness means to function like him. Which means we've been given God's nature, righteousness, so that we can function as he functions in the world. So that we can call things that are not as though they were. So we can declare the end from the beginning. Amen? Hebrews 11.6. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. He that comes to God has to believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So he's put eternity in all of us so that we would search that out, so that he can be revealed. That's how he did it. Amen. If we try to function any other way than by faith, we malfunction. We were, we're created to operate one way. And for the most part, I'll speak for myself. Most of my life, uh, well, the first half of it anyway, so far, uh, I didn't live by faith. I lived by chance. I lived by what I would call luck or timing, you know, being in the right place at the right time, the wrong place at the wrong time, so forth. I wasn't looking for any of this. Amen? But I, at some point, I came to the place where, I mean, I believed in God, but I just didn't believe in Him being interacting. Just he's out there somewhere, like a deist, you know. I believe he exists, but he doesn't want to mess with me. So he that comes to God has to believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. Right? So faith is the key to everything. Look, look at uh, Jeremiah 1 and 12. These are the things that we have to establish in ourselves, in the way that we think, in the way that we approach life, in the way that we deal with the circumstances and situations that are going on around us. Because he's, he, to Jeremiah, then said the Lord unto me, thou hast well seen. Yeah, he tells him, what do you see? And he, he, tell, he describes what it is that he sees. And then God said, you've seen well. Thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. Praise the Lord. That's how faith works. What did you see? Did you see what? The riots? Or did you see God healing hearts? Did you see God healing attitudes? Right? Did, do you see COVID-19 and, and the news and how many are dead today and how many they expect will be dead tomorrow and, and how many people have it and how many have tested positive and blah, 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 and how bad the economy is going to be because of all of this stuff? Or are you seeing all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose? Praise the Lord. That's what I mean. Life is how you see it. Yeah. And that's a fact. You, that you can, you know, make a joke about it. But the truth is, this is how faith works. God always brings his word into being. Yes. 
if there's somebody who believes it. Think about Mary. God said, uh, you know, you're going to have a child, and blah, blah, blah. And she says, whoa, wait a minute. I, I've never been with a man. I don't know anything about that kind of stuff. How can it be? And the angel said, God has spoken. And she said, be it unto me, even as you have said. And that's what I'm saying. Yes. She basically just said, amen. Yeah. So be it. And that's what we have to do. That's the song that we sang. Yeah. Yeah. Amen, amen, amen. All of our children are saved. Yeah. And their children and their children's children. That's, how, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Amen. John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Yes. Amen. Word was God. The Word was God. Verse 14. And we beheld Him. We saw what was invisible before that. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Yes. So, that was God's intention from the very beginning. We know that because we were in Christ before the foundation of the world. But Christ didn't exist. Yes. In the sense that we understand as a man. Right? right? He was still in God. Right. So, how did God create the universe? Words. The same way Jesus was manifest into this earth. Say, so, okay, we had a woman there with an egg, but God is invisible, so where did the sperm come from? The mouth, His Word. His Word is what gave life to that human form. Praise the Lord. Same way, the same way he created the universe, yes. he creates everything. Yes. Look at Philippians 4.19. Yep. That's why Eric and I were talking Wednesday. Thoughts are the most important thing, but words are the most powerful. Yes. Thoughts drive your words. So that's why we have to have our mind renewed to the Word of God. So the words that come out of our mouth aren't contradicting what God has said. They're in agreement with it so we can get the benefit of it. Yes. Right. But my God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. <laughs> Praise the Lord. My God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Lord, perform your word. He said, that's what I do. That's the only reason I say my word is so that I can make it come to pass. Yeah, right. There shouldn't be no reason for us to doubt unless we're so focused on what's going on around us that we lose track of the deep calling us to deep. Right. Praise the Lord. Our success or our failure is determined by how we see and what we say. Yeah. And that's as simple as it is. God saw darkness, but he didn't say, wow, it's dark. He said, light be. Yes. Praise the Lord. Proverbs 23, verse 7. We'll wrap up with these last couple of scriptures. Proverbs 23 and verse 7. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. He's talking about man. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. Praise the Lord. That's talking about the world's view. As, as we think, we become. Right? Because our thoughts determine our words, our words determine our actions and the results of those things. So as we are in our heart, not, not in our head, but in our heart. That's, who, that's how God defines us. Right? The deep, call it the deep, right? All right, Habakkuk. Last scripture here, Habakkuk 2, verses 2 through 4. And these are familiar scriptures. We've, we've quoted them and read them and studied them for years. But the Lord answered me and said, because he said, how can this stuff be? And the Lord answered him and said, write the vision. Make it plain upon tables that he may run that reads it. Right? For the vision is yet for an appointed time. It's, it's, see, it's already done, yes. yeah. but it's done for an appointed time. Yeah. For, yet for an appointed time. But the, at the end, it shall speak yeah. and not lie, though it tarry. Wait for it. 
Because it will surely come. It will not tear. He's talking about His Word being manifest. Amen. Behold, His soul which is lifted up is not upright in Him, but the just shall live by His faith. Now, this is what I talked about last week. Remember, I was, I was saying uh, the soul part of me is still searching for salvation. This. This already knows it's absolutely perfect with God. The problem is getting this to agree with this. That's why we have the renewing of the mind. So I was using that song as, a, as kind of a, an analogy or a metaphor for the fact that my brain is still searching sometimes for the perfect Nathan. Because it knows he doesn't exist here in this body. And he doesn't do everything the way he should. So my soul, even though I've been blessed with inspiration, the Word of God... My soul is still searching for salvation because it hasn't come into agreement with the finished product. It's still seeing myself on this path trying to get there when God is saying, You've already, you're already there. That's how I have declared you to be righteous. Yes. So behold, his soul, which is lifted up, which means we're focusing more on our intellect or on our thought life than we are on him. His soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him. The soul isn't right. It's my spirit that's right. My soul is still struggling to figure this out and to make it fit. Right? But I am perfect in God. So my soul, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him. But the just, that's why the just have to live by faith. Because your brain will keep telling you you're a loser. You're not going to ever get this done. You're not going to accomplish it. Your kids will be lost. This will happen. A bad thing's going to take place. All of those things come from here. Come from the soul. Praise the Lord. But the just shall live by his faith. Let's just live by faith. Let's just agree with God that we, we have already been to the, the end, found out it's really good. So we can come back here and live our lives in the midst of all the chaos knowing there's a good outcome coming. I don't care how weird it gets here, the end is going to be really, really good. And it can be, we can be blessed here in the midst of all of this if we don't let the things Dictate our thoughts and our words. Let the Word of God determine what we see. Because we can see things that are not as though they are. Amen. We have that because of faith. Because of Christ in us. The hope of glory. Give the Lord a hand. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. We're just, we're, we're just so much more than we realize. And I don't mean that egotistically. I'm just agreeing with God. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. We are His offspring. Heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Yes. Amen. One with God. I and my Father. I can say this. I and my Father are one. Yes. Because He said it first. Praise the Lord. Yes. Amen. God bless all of you. Have a great week. Praise God. Yes. So it's going to be a nice Indian summer. So yes. enjoy it. Praise God. Yes.